about three miles north of Ullerpool, Loch Broom opens out onto Loch Kinnaird, where we swing down into the little fishing village of Ardmere. There are plenty of interesting detours in this part of the drive, like the road trip through the Coigach Mountains to Achaltabui. I turned a corner and dived into a wide lay-by. The icon of Coigach come into view, Stack Polly, the most wonderful little peak in Scotland. It's barely 2,000 feet high, but it doesn't matter. Size isn't everything. The summit of Stag Polly is only reached by scrambling over some very impressive sandstone pinnacles at the top, and are compared to the ones found at the Kuringen Sky. Stag Polly is a shapeshifter, an amazing mountain that seems to look different from every angle that you see it from. This truly is a primitive landscape. I arrived at Achaltabui, a straggling little village that meanders down the coast for a while, under the massive peaks of Benmore Coigach. It has a shop, a post office and a very good hotel. It gets no awards for its layout and it's not particularly picturesque, but visitors don't come here for the dazzling nightlife. They come to get away from it all, and they're certainly well away from it all here. I headed back. The view over Loch Oskig, towards the way we come in, is absolutely stunning. The mountains to the south of the road are so different to the rest of the Coigach peaks. As I approached Knockin Crag, a huge stag thundered across the road right in front of me and leapt gracefully over a fence, followed by an even bigger one, up into the crag above. I was now at Knockin Crag. This little hut is a bit of an interpretation centre, giving explanations and showing examples of how bands of rock can be found in the mountains here, under rock that is 500 million years older. There was a statue of a geology student at the rock room exit, a bad or good day, and headed out along the path. The crag top trail then follows the rising path, past a series of introductory tablets entitled Around the World in 600 Million Years. I reached the top of the crag and the path opened out in front of me. Then lazing beside the path I bumped into the two stags that crossed the road in front of the car earlier on. They were only about seven metres ahead. I watched to see what they would do next. I still had the stags for company. One was grazing in the crag above. I went over for a closer look. The stag turned and headed behind a hillock. Stopping for one final inquisitive look before disappearing from view. The Eaglestone viewpoint is a marvellous wall with a view, a most wonderful view over the Loch and Struan Glen and to the magnificent Coiger Peaks over to the west. The North Coast 500, the Scottish Tourist Board's creation to attract visitors to the less visited far north of Scotland, is touted as Scotland's answer to Route 66. Does it live up to its claim? We'll see. Well, if this is an example of the views we can expect, then it's going to be an exceptional trip. As we make our way through Elfin, the magnificent peak of Sylvan makes its first appearance. Ledmore Junction. This is where we join the road from the southeast. This trip covers a wonderful 60 mile section from Ullapool to Kyleskew, only 30 miles south of Cape Wrath. A few miles down the road, I arrived at the Bone Caves car park. As I reached the trees, a flat area opened out below the path, giving an excellent view of a series of attractive waterfalls. The gradually rising path heads back over towards the fast flowing Altman Earth. Gallic for the burn of the caves. The path then headed over towards a steep limestone crag. As I looked closer, I realised that this was an underground spring. It was amazing to watch as this turbulent little burn seemingly appeared from nowhere. From a still clear pool of stones in the gravelly valley floor, this torrent just appeared in full flow and tumbled downstream unabated. An amazing sight and a wonderful experience. I headed on up the glen, along a very good path with steep slopes on either side. 
The caves are now a site of special scientific interest and were first excavated in 1889. Remains of polar bear, brown bear, lynx, arctic fox and lemmings have been found and reindeer bones dating as far back as 47,000 years. These species must have roamed about the highlands many, many years ago. This part of the drive is through a lovely open stretch, with the wilderness of the knock and locking of the Glen Canis Forest to the west, and the green limestone crags of the Inchnadaff Forest to the east. We had now reached the little hamlet of Inchnadaff. It is a hotel, but that's about it. Oh, and a phone box. It would need one because the mobile signal in these parts is almost non-existent. Over to the west is Loch Assent, under the magnificent crags of Cunyag. The road heads on along the banks of Loch Assent, and sitting in its spit of land at the east end of the loch is Arbreck Castle. And there's an opportunity to stop here for a wander around the romantic old ruin. I parked the car and headed over. I couldn't believe it. The water level was greatly increased from the last time I was up in the early summer. Hardwreck Castle was now sitting in an island, and the usual access wasn't just slightly underwater. I was astonished. I have since read reports that the loch's level fluctuates with the amount of rainfall. Well, it must have been pouring since it was last up. I was now heading west towards Loch Inver. There's a seven mile long shortcut which heads north to Kyleskew, just beyond here, where nervous drivers can bypass Loch Inver and the hair raising single track roads of North Assent, but that would be a big mistake. The road follows Loch Assent for most of the way. No trip to this corner of Scotland would be complete without a stop at Loch Inver, even if it was just to fill up with petrol. This attractive little village is cradled by the extremely rugged crags that surround the head of the sea loch, where the river Inver meets the sea. Loch Inver is supposed to be the second busiest fishing port in Scotland, attracting fishing boats from many different parts of Europe to its large and very busy fish market. But I have to say, it didn't seem that busy when I was there. Maybe I just visited at the wrong time. We are now at the start of the single track roads. This is a part of the drive where it's not just the scenery that takes your breath away. Forget your worries. Forget the time. Forget about your speed. The winding road will make sure that that's not an issue. Just drive. There's a turn off for Achmelvich after two miles. I stayed there for two nights. It is a must-see for any visitor to Ascent along a short nailed biter of a road, but the views of the bay are sensational. The scene below appeared almost tropical. The magnificent beaches in this seemingly hidden part of Scotland are amongst the best in Britain. The magnificent mountain of Suovin appeared once again to the south. The view of the beach from the cliffs was everything you could ask for. West Highland scenery at its best. I took one last lingering look at this tropical corner of the highlands and headed back down to the marker. Then I watched the sun going down. It was paradise.